Bloodborne's punishing difficulty holds a mirror up to its oppressively grim atmosphere and story. Hotline Miami's dizzying neon fever violence complements the head-fuzzying moment at the end when you're told that nothing you've been doing matters. Journey makes your journeyman glide freely or trudge painfully in concert with the arc of its titular spirit journey. These games hit their mark so keenly because their interactive mechanics work in harmony with their total artistic packages. But gameplay is more than supplemental or artistically subordinate. I think it's artistically generative. Certain themes demand certain sorts of gameplay elements, but I think it's equally valid for gameplay itself to make demands of its setting and themes without losing artistic merit. But before I can talk about that, let me steal a page from the Book of Bitung and introduce a 19th century German philosopher first. Arthur Schopenhauer was a tremendously influential thinker best known for his radical sideburns and for his famous work, The World as Will and Representation. The focus of his writing is the will, the central driving and irrational force that compels action. The will is that which craves, desires, urges, and strives. It's separate from the intellect, that which understands, reflects, and transcends. Schopenhauer's ideal art addresses the intellect, not the will. Art challenges and allows us to break free of the will and see the world as it really is, to lay bare our desires, motivations, and indeed our entire condition. He thought that Dutch still life painting was the best type of painting because it allowed viewers to see beauty in ordinary, everyday objects. He didn't care for depictions of nude women, though, or of prepared food, because they invoke the will. A painting of a woman calls forth sexual want. A painting of a juicy steak elicits hunger. These desires to Schopenhauer distract from the intellectual and nourishing reflection that art can grant us access to. Game designer Brian Moriarty cited Schopenhauer in his talk from GDC 2011 titled An Apology for Roger Ebert. He identifies an apparent tension between video games which, by their interactive nature, require the player to assert their will on their systems by controlling them, and true art, which, according to Schopenhauer, provides an outlet for the observer to bury the will and instead reflect and understand. Sid Meier famously defined games as a series of interesting choices, and choice is a fundamental expression of will. How can an activity motivated by decision-making, striving, goals, and competition a deliberate concentration of the force of will be used to transcend will itself. You might as well try to smother a flame with oxygen. But Moriarty's application of Schopenhauer is sorely short-sighted. It's true that video games call upon the player to make choices and express their will, but what if that's not a distraction? What if it's the point? What if a game endeavors to examine the will itself as a subject? What if a game sets out to make the player question how they make decisions, what they desire, and what they're willing to sacrifice? Papers, Please is a fantastic example of a game like this. The desire to keep your character's family alive and healthy by doing your job as a customs officer by the book conflicts directly with the desire to be an empathetic moral person by granting exceptions when it's the right thing to do. Papers, Please is able to evoke the sort of deep, intellectual reflection Schopenhauer praised despite requiring the player to exercise their will, because it's will itself, choice and desire, that are under the microscope. To fully understand will, we're asked to experience it first and reflect. This idea that interaction can give us insight into our condition is hardly a radical one. It actually predates video games as a popular hobby. Marina Abramovich is sometimes called the grandmother of performance art. In 1974, she presented an experimental piece. It was called Rhythm Zero. She stood motionless, surrounded by 72 objects. Spectators were allowed to do whatever they wanted to her using any of the objects on the table. Most of them were harmless, like a feather boa or a rose, but among the items were scissors, knives, and a loaded gun. Don't worry, nobody shot her, but that in itself is interesting. Why didn't anyone shoot her? They were ostensibly allowed to do it. Somebody did cut her dress a little, though. Why would they do that? The question, why do people do the things they do, is timeless. Authors, poets, and playwrights have grappled with this question in an uncountable number of different flavors and varieties over human history. Abramovich poked at the question in 74, and video games continue the tradition today. 
To mention Hotline Miami again, it wants the player to kill everybody on every level. That's the only thing you can do, but despite it being your only option, the game asks you anyway if you like hurting other people. They're not real people you're hurting, but why play the game at all if you don't take some pleasure in the fantasy? At the end, the developers self-insert and explicitly tell you that it was all pointless. So why did you play it? Why did you choose to continue? What motivated you to play it if it's all allegedly pointless? Those questions point toward the artistic content of Hotline Miami. Gameplay is artistic unto itself. Often, the way that a game's decisions shed light on the will is its central artistic endeavor, and the setting winds up doing the supplementing. This War of Mine and Telltale's Walking Dead examine similar sets of decisions despite being contextualized by different settings and stories, but artistically they resonate similarly. The choices necessary to survive are interesting in many contexts, but not any context. If Lee and Clementine didn't have to deal with the physical threat of zombies and a scarcity of resources, there'd be no tension, no story, and no reason to care. Games that want to plumb the depths of decisions related to survival require certain kinds of context to work. But the zombies still aren't at the heart of The Walking Dead, and the war isn't at the heart of this war of mine. It's human nature and decision making that take center stage and make demands of the story. Games have the advantage when it comes to giving the player a glimpse at the platonic will, in a way that static media need to exert greater effort to accomplish. Schopenhauer loved this still life because it doesn't explain the bowl of fruit, it just shows it to you in its barest form. It allows you to use your intellect to read into the true nature of the objects on display. Video games do this for choices instead of fruit. When you watch a movie, you may ask why did that character do that, and the answer often lies in what that character needs or wants in the context of that movie. But video games are immaterial. Nothing bad will happen to you if you make a bad decision, so the questions raised are of a higher order. Moving the thought process from specific motivations of specific characters to general principles takes one fewer step of analytical extrapolation. Games that do choice right have no trouble elevating questions to the ideal. Why did I decide my choice was the right thing to do if I had no stake in it? Why would anyone do that? These are big questions, but questions that games can explore more deftly and concisely than any other medium on the block.